Wagner. I'm NAMP Colorado's Executive Director, and I am thrilled to welcome you to our first ever public policy series program. Uh, this year's first inaugural one is um, Understanding the Issues and a ballot primer for your 2020 uh, election. Uh, many of you have already received your ballots and discovered that they're very long, somewhat complicated and very intricate and the issues themselves are complicated and intricate. Um, so that's why we wanted to have this program and bring in some experts to uh, give us some information that we can use. And you can use that in conjunction with the ballot primer that we put together, which has links to the actual ballot language. If there is a yes campaign and a no campaign, it has links to those as well so that you can do some research. And um, while voting is one of our premier privileges in America, I would also encourage that educated voting uh, is equally as important and that's why we're here today. So one of the things I wanna do is to thank our series sponsors uh, DPC companies, Everwest Real Estate Investors, and United Properties have generously, generously made investments in our public policy program, and uh, we want to thank them. I want to recognize the program coordinators for today's program, and they include the Programs Committee Chair, Brian Dietz, the Program Committee Vice Chair, Sarah Crute, Caitlin Quander, who will be serving as our moderator today, and myself, I think myself. Um, and then we have a terrific, terrific panel that we've put together today. Um, I'm uh, going to just give you a little recap of what we're gonna be um, going over today. We're going to be hearing um, in, our program is gonna cover four different sections. The first section is gonna give you an overview on the Gallagher Amendment repeal, which is Amendment B. The, um, then we're gonna hear about the statewide initiatives, the other statewide initiatives. And we're going to hear from Senator Cory Gardner. Uh, we did invite former Governor Hickenlooper and he unfortunately was not able to join us today. Uh, and then we're going to have um, a recap on some of the Denver initiatives, particularly because uh, NAMP Colorado did um, come out in favor of one of those when we get there. As I did mention, um, the ballot primer was sent to you this morning, so you should already have that in your inbox. You should be able to use that as we go through the program. Links to the Spire speaker bios will be on the NAP website, as well as a copy of this webinar later today. If you're not, uh, if you have uh, people in your office who weren't able to join us, and, and you think this would be good information to share with them. Our program should run until about 9.30 this morning. Um, we may, depending on the question and answers, run over just a little bit, but hopefully you'll be able to stick with us because this is such terrific information. Uh, panelists, if you would turn on your videos for a quick introduction. Um, our panelists for today, uh, Caitlin Quander is today's program moderator and she's a shareholder at Brownstein Hyatt Farber Shrek. And she's also the chair of our NAOP Public Policy Committee. Thank you, Caitlin. Councilman Jolyn Clark from the Denver City Council District 7. Thank you, Councilman. Chris Brown, who's the Director of Policy and Research at the Common Sense Institute. And Reeves Brown, who's the Project Manager at Building a Better Colorado. Senator Cory Gardner will join us later, as I mentioned. Um, so again, um, panelists, as a reminder, if you, when you're not speaking, if you would um, mute your audio and video, um, we'll get going. And um, it, like I said, if you have questions or need any technical assistance, put that in the Q&A section as we go forward. So without further ado, Caitlin, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get us going. Thanks, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I think Kathy gave a great summary of uh, why uh, NAF thinks um, this panel and, and hearing from these speakers is important. And we're going to start off with uh, Reeves Brown, who I actually saw give a, a version of this presentation. And I thought, I have never heard Gallagher explained in such a simple way because it is complicated and complex. So um, uh, just as a quick introduction, 
Um, Reeves Brown is an independent public policy consultant, a project manager at Building a Better Colorado Project. That is a nonpartisan effort to engage Coloradans in a constructive con conversation about how to improve our state and seek consensus on public policy recommendations. Prior to joining Building a Better Colorado, Reeves served in Governor John Hickenlooper's ca cabinet as executive director of DOLA, which is Colorado Department of Local Affairs. He also has served as executive director of Club 20 and the Colorado Cattlemen's Association. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Reeves. Thank you very much, Caitlin. And uh, thanks to Neop for hosting this this morning. Uh, this is the, these are incredibly important issues and uh, really appreciate you teeing them up to, to raise awareness. So I'm going to uh, share my screen uh, here this morning and run through a bunch of slides in a uh, fairly short amount of time. And uh, uh, then hopefully we will have an opportunity for some questions uh, when we're done. So I'm going to talk about the Gallagher Amendment, uh, explain what it is, uh, and also explain how we expect it to uniquely impact Colorado in 2021, uh, next year, and also uh, talk about Amendment B. Uh, I'm just going to explain what Amendment B does. Building a Better Colorado, as Caitlin said, is a nonpartisan organization, non-advocacy, so we take no position on the measure. Uh, but we'll try and explain at least what it does. So to understand the Gallagher Amendment, uh, you have to understand what property taxes are because property taxes uh, are entirely uh, the focus and, and intent of the Gallagher Amendment. Uh, as you can see on this uh, chart, uh, uh, property taxes are uh, assessed locally, they're valued locally, they're collected locally, they're spent locally. Property taxes entirely benefit the funding of local uh, public services. The state receives no property tax. The state has not had a property tax since 1964. Uh, and as you can see on this pie chart, fully half of all property tax collected locally uh, across the state benefit K through 12. It's the it's the local share of the local state partnership to fund K through 12. It's uh, the largest part of your local government budget. It's also the largest part of your state government budget. Uh, additionally, counties receive another uh, fourth of property taxes to pay for all things county, uh, county roads, county administration, county sheriff, all things county. Uh, special districts receive another 20% to pay for um, uh, local uh, public services uh, through special districts, uh, fire districts, ambulance districts, emergency services district, library district, rec district, uh, etc. So uh, also to understand Gallagher, you have to understand how uh, property taxes are calculated, which is a very simple two-step formula. Uh, you, the amount of property tax that you pay uh, on your property is simply the assessed value of your property, which is how much of your property is actually subject to taxation, because no property is taxed at 100% of its market value. It's taxed at a portion of it. And that's based on the market value. So whatever you could sell your property for, so think of your house here, whatever you could sell for times uh, an assessment rate, again, that dictates how much of your property is subject to tax. And we put those assessment rates in the constitution in 1982. And as you can see in this chart, all property in the state, uh, uh, farmland, uh, small businesses, uh, commercial buildings, um, industrial property, vacant land, all property is taxed at 29% of its total market value, except houses. Per the Gallagher Amendment, houses are taxed on a formula uh, that uh, currently taxes houses at 7.15% of their market value. So again, take the market value of your property times the appropriate assessment rate for that class of property to determine how much of your property is actually subject to be taxed. And then you simply multiply that by the number of mills that the voters in your district have approved to fund all local services. Now, each mill that voters approve generates $1 for each $1,000 of assessed valuation. So I'll put some numbers to this so you can kind of see how this works. If you had a $500,000 house, well, the Constitution, per the Gallagher Amendment, says that houses are currently taxed at 7.15% of their market value. And so you know, $36,000 of your $500,000 house is actually subject to be taxed. Uh, if you live in a district where the voters have approved 60 mills to fund all local services, which is about average, uh, each mill generates $1 for every $1,000 of assessed value. So 60 times 36, your annual tax bill on your $500,000 house is $2,160. And that pays for that pie chart of local services. Half of the $2,160 pays for the local share of K through 12. Uh, a fourth of it pays for all county services. 20% pays for all special districts. So where did the Gallagher Amendment come from? Uh, the legislature referred the Gallagher Amendment to Colorado voters in 1982. And at that time, uh, in 1982, of all property in the state, 
uh, houses in Durango, uh, commercial buildings in Denver, vacant land uh, in, on the Eastern Plains, uh, all property statewide, houses made up about 45% of total state valuation. And the Gallagher Amendment simply said, that's a good ratio, uh, let's keep it forever. And so when the voters adopted the Gallagher Amendment in 1982, they froze in time that forevermore, houses would uh, never represent more or less than about 45% of total state valuation and everything else would be 55%. So why did the legislature refer Gallagher uh, to us in 1982? Well, if you were here in the, in the 70s uh, or 60s, uh, you know Colorado was experiencing some fairly significant population growth. Uh, Colorado had kind of been discovered as an international ski destination. And uh, uh, we thought at the time uh, in 1982 that that was kind of an anomaly. Uh, and it turns out that it wasn't an anomaly. Uh, Colorado had indeed been discovered and we've seen significant population growth for 50 years. And all those people moving here has, has inflated the value of residential property, which has grown the property tax bill. And that's why the legislature referred Gallagher uh, to the voters in 1982. Uh, this chart just shows, uh, going back to 1983, when we first adopted the Gallagher Amendment, how much the growth of, of uh, market value of residential property in the blue line has outpaced the growth of market value of everything else uh, in the brown line. Uh, market value of residential property has grown year over year, uh, almost every year, uh, regardless of the economy since 1983, except for a brief uh, four-year window during the national subprime mortgage crisis. Um, I was challenged on this slide uh, a couple weeks ago. Someone said, but that brown line can't be right because commercial values haven't been flat. Um, and if you look at that brown line, it's not flat. It, it grows from about 40 million to over 200 million. It just looks flat when you, when you compare it to the uh, relatively much larger growth of residential property. Uh, so residential property has grown in value so much in Colorado over the last uh, 38 years that today, a residential property makes up 80% of total property valuation statewide and everything else uh, has shrunk to just 20% of the total valuation. Uh, but when we adopted the Gallagher Amendment in 1982, we said that's not possible. Uh, houses can only make up 45% of total valuation. So how does your legislature make 80% equal 45% to comply with your constitutional mandate? Well, you have to go back to our, our formula. Uh, if Gallagher says that the total valuation of houses statewide can never be more or less than about 45% of the total. And yet the market value of houses is growing faster than the market value of everything else. The only way to keep the value of houses at 45% is to shrink the assessment rate, how much of each house is actually subject to taxation. And so that's what we've done for 38 years. Uh, uh, back in 1982, when we adopted the Gallagher Amendment, all property in the state uh, was taxed at a flat rate of 30% of its market value. When we adopted the Gallagher Amendment, uh, we dropped the uh, assessment rate on houses to 21% the first year, and then we put it on a formula um, to go up or down as might be necessary to keep houses share of total valuation at 45%. But because the value of houses has so far outpaced the value of everything else ever since then, Gallagher Amendment uh, formula has forced the residential assessment rate down consistently to the point today that it is 7.15%. At the same time that we uh, adopted the Gallagher Amendment, we also uh, changed the assessment rate on all other properties, so like small businesses, uh, from 30% to 29%, and we froze it at 29%. And so what that's resulted in is that the relative rate of taxation that businesses pay has grown uh, relative to the rate of of taxation of residential property over time. Again, back in 1982, all property was taxed equally at uh, 30%. Uh, today, businesses pay about four times, a little over uh, four times what residential property owners pay on the same value of property. And so just to put some numbers to that, if you had a $300,000 house in 1981, again, all property at that time was taxed at 30% of its market value. If you lived in a 60 mil district, your tax bill was $5,400. Uh, to pay for that pie chart of local services. Today, if you have that same $300,000 house, and I'm adjusting the math here for inflation, just, just to make math easy. Uh, if you have that same $300,000 house, only 7.15% is subject to taxation. If you live in the same 60 mil district, then in inflation adjusted dollars, your tax bill has dropped below $1,300, about a fourth of what it was uh, 38 years ago. And that's happened on every house in the state. And that's eroded that residential tax base that pays for those local services. 
conversely, uh, if you own a business, um, you uh, in 1981, if you if you had a $300,000 business, you still paid uh, 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 an assessment rate uh, of 30 percent, uh, and so your tax bill was the same as your house, $5,400. Uh, today, though, with a fixed assessment rate of 29%, you're still paying about the same amount on your $300,000 house, uh, but it's four times as much as what uh, you'd be paying on your house of the same value. So Gallagher requires the legislature every two years to perform a, uh, a, uh, a recalculation of, of uh, market value uh, and, and property valuation for houses versus uh, non-residential property to make sure that that houses are staying at 45 percent. Um, if the that that calculation uh, compares the uh, looks at the last two years and it compares the the growth in market value of residential property to the growth in value of, of non-residential property and if those two grow at the same rate then uh, then Gallagher uh, won't require any change. That, that calculation, uh, two-year calculation began in July and it will be delivered to the legislature next spring. Uh, so if, there's, if they grow at the same rate, Gallagher won't require a change. But if houses, uh, value of houses over the last two years has grown faster than the rate of growth of non-residential, then Gallagher will again necessitate that the residential assessment rate goes down uh, to keep residential share at 45%. Uh, conversely, if that study uh, finds that that uh, residential property has not grown as fast as non-residential, uh, then Gallagher, as it was intended, would say the residential assessment rate must go up. Uh, but that can't happen because 10 years after we adopted Gallagher in 1982, we adopted the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, Tabor in 1992, which says that no tax can go up without a statewide vote of the people, uh, which has never happened uh, on the residential assessment rate. So in that case, the residential assessment rate would just stay flat. So looking at that chart of growth again over time, uh, the big question is looking at the last two years, uh, what has been the rate of growth of residential property compared to non-residential property? Uh, we're gonna blow this chart up looking at the, the last 10 years or so since 2009 so we can get a better look at it. So this is that same chart going uh, back just to 2009. Uh, and if we look at the last two years uh, growth of residential value, obviously residential values have grown. There's no question there. Uh, but we have had a recession since March or April, which uh, makes up about three or four months of that 24 month window. Uh, but the recession has not impacted the value of houses. Uh, even though it has slowed the sale of some houses in some areas for a time, uh, it has not reduced the value of houses. And so we can fully expect that uh, the current two year calculation will peg the value of residential property in the state at an all time high, uh, probably north of $900 billion, uh, approaching a trillion dollars. When we look at non-residential property and the growth of non-residential property in the brown line, by contrast, there's two categories of non-residential property that are valued on two different time frames that are affected differently uh, by the current recession. We're gonna look at those separately. Uh, the first category we're gonna look at is commercial buildings, which makes up about 55% of non-residential property. And that's valued on the same two-year window as residential property. And then there's everything else that's not residential. 40% uh, of this category is oil and gas production, and it's it's valued only on a on a 12 month window. So as concerns commercial buildings, again, that's valued on the same two year window as residential. Uh, and because commercial buildings value is largely dictated by the uh, 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 rental rates for commercial buildings, uh, and because 20% of downtown Denver is leased out to oil and gas companies, and we've been in an oil crash uh, since last December, uh, we can uh, fully expect that's going to have some downward pressure on uh, the value of commercial buildings. Uh, additionally, uh, we've had the, the uh, recession since March or April, and uh, even though that has not impacted the value of houses, it most certainly has impacted the, the rental rate uh, for commercial buildings and therefore the value of build, commercial buildings. So we can expect the combination of the oil crash recession to probably reduce the value of commercial buildings by 4 to 6% in the current two-year calculation. Uh, when we look at the value of all other non-residential property, again, 40% of which is oil and gas production, that doesn't look at a 24-month window. That's based on the 12 months of 2020. And so obviously the recession since March or April, which will make up about uh, nine of those 12 months, is going to have a much more uh, adverse impact on the value of all other non-residential property. And additionally, of course, we've had, uh, we expect to have had the oil crash for the entire duration of this 12-month period. 
Uh, so we can probably expect a four to 6% drop in the value of all other non-residential property uh, as well. So when you add those two together, we're probably looking about a 10% a drop in the value of, of non-residential property during the current two-year calculation compared to an all-time high uh, of north of 900 billion for residential property. So the answer to our, our, our question is yes, residential property has again outpaced the growth in non-residential property and fairly significantly this time uh, due to a combination of the recession and the oil crash. And therefore, we can expect Gallagher will force that residential assessment rate down again to keep residential share at 45%. So how, how much will it force the residential rate down? Well, if you, if you look at this chart and look what happened in 2019, uh, in the brown, non-residential property statewide in 2019 had an actual market value of about $224 billion. And non-residential property for property tax purposes has an assessed valuation of about 32% on average. So that amounted to about $73 billion of assessed valuation uh, for non-residential property last year. Uh, compared to residential property last year, which had a market value of $873 billion. And the assessed value of residential property, again, is dictated by the Gallagher Amendment that says that assessed value of residential property can't be more or less than 45% of the total. So if you work backwards, if the assessed value of non-residential was $73 billion last year, then Gallagher said the assessed value of residential couldn't be more than about 62 billion, and therefore the assessment rate on houses had to drop from 7.2 to 7.15%. Uh, so in 2020, if we plug in the numbers we just looked at, uh, again, we're expecting about a 10% drop in the uh, market value of non-residential property statewide. And at a 32% assessment rate, that will amount to about $64 billion of assessed valuation. Uh, again, we were expecting an all-time high in the valuation of residential property north of $900 billion. Uh, and Gallagher says that the assessed value of residential can't be more than 45% of the total. So if, if we expect the assessed value of non-residential to be 64 billion, then Gallagher will say the assessed value of residential can't be more than about 52 billion. And to arrive at that number, the residential assessment rate must drop again, uh, this time below 6%, uh, which amounts to about a 19% drop. Uh, uh, we don't know exactly what that number is gonna be until the Division of Property Taxation uh, delivers its study to the legislature next year, but it will be uh, lower and it will be rather significant compared to where we were, uh, uh, where we are today and where we have come from. Uh, uh, the kind of back of the napkin numbers I've shared with you uh, was confirmed by the Division of Property Tax uh, uh, earlier this year when they uh, issued a preliminary forecast. They, they think that number could be 5.88. So um, it, it will be below 6% uh, and, uh, and probably in the 5.8 something range. So how will a 19% drop in the residential assessment rate affect you? Well, it depends. Uh, as uh, whether you own a business or if you just own a home. It also depends on where you live. Uh, more specifically, it depends on how much of your county's tax base uh, depends on residential property to fund local services. Obviously, a county that depends more heavily on residential property to fund local services will suffer a larger revenue drop uh, based on a 19% drop in the residential rate. Uh, this chart just shows a sampling of counties around the state, and it shows in that center column the, the wide disparity in, in how much uh, different counties depend on residential property for their tax base. Uh, counties like uh, Adams, uh, Chafee, Elbert, uh, Jefferson, Mesa, they depend fairly heavily on residential property for their tax base, whereas counties like Bent uh, or Weld depend more on agriculture or, or oil and gas production. So those counties that depend more heavily on residential property, uh, uh, then we'll see in the right column, we'll see a, a more significant drop in their, in their revenue to fund local services, upwards of of 10 and, uh, and uh, even over 13% in the case of Elbert County. And that drop in revenue, uh, which results from Gallagher's forced reduction of the residential assessment rate, uh, is really a permanent cut because uh, even though the economy will recover, uh, the residential assessment rate cannot uh, recover because again, Tabor says uh, it requires a statewide vote of the people for the residential assessment rate to go up. And that's why that's never happened. So local governments and taxing jurisdictions will have three options for how to deal with this 10 to 13% drop in revenue. Uh, number one, they can permanently reduce services uh, to balance their budget. Uh, number two, they could go to their voters and ask voters to you know, raise the local mill levy just enough to offset Gallagher's forced reduction of the residential assessment rate. 
Uh, and homeowner voters oftentimes do vote for a higher mill levy because it doesn't cost them anything because even though they're paying on more mills, they're paying on a lower residential assessment rate. So it's a wash. But remember that every other class of property is fixed at 29%. So every time voters vote to raise their local mill levy just enough to offset Gallagher's reduction of the residential rate and sustain funding for the, the fire district, uh, that's a real tax increase for, for small businesses and every other class of a property owner because they're paying uh, on more mills on a fixed rate of 29%. So every time voters vote to raise that mill levy, it shifts the tax burden from homeowners to the business community. Uh, a third option for local governments would be to kind of just uh, cross their fingers and hope that when the economy recovers that the underlying market value of residential property will grow enough to offset and mitigate Gallagher's uh, reduction of the residential assessment rate. And that does happen uh, in some communities where we see significant growth in market value. So particularly along the front range or the metropolitan area, but that doesn't really happen so much in rural Colorado. And therefore uh, Gallagher has a very unintended uh, a disproportionate adverse impact on rural communities because they see the same drop in erosion uh, of the residential assessment rate in erosion of their residential tax base, but they don't see uh, the corresponding growth in the market value of residential property to mitigate that. And we talked about how the uh, every time we raise the local mill levy, it shifts that tax burden from homeowners to businesses. And this chart just shows how that's happened over time. Uh, back in 1983, when we first adopted the Gallagher Amendment, uh, we started with a 21% residential assessment rate, which which meant that for every dollar that homeowners paid in the blue, uh, businesses paid $1.40 uh, in property tax on the same value of property based on that initial 55-45 split. Uh, but since the value of residential property has grown so much more than the value of non-residential property since then, the residential assessment rate has been forced down to 7.15%, uh, which means for every dollar that homeowners pay at a 7% residential rate, uh, businesses uh, pay over $4 because they're at a fixed 29% rate. Uh, and uh, next year, if Gallagher forces the residential assessment rate below 6%, as we expect, then for every dollar that homeowners pay in the blue, businesses will pay $5, the 5 to 1 ratio. So that shift in the tax burden to the business community has been very real and, and fairly significant. So the lesson that we've learned from all of this is you cannot get something for nothing in tax policy. There are winners and losers in, in every tax policy. Uh, in the case of Gallagher, if you have a Gallagher amendment such as we do, the winner in that equation is homeowners, right? Because Gallagher forces their residential assessment rate down over time. Uh, the loser in that equation is local public service providers that depend on that residential tax base to fund local services. Uh, and, and the public at large uh, loses in that sense that depend on local services. Uh, rural communities uh, lose in that equation because uh, Gallagher, again, has a disproportionate effect on eroding their tax base without growing uh, their, their residential market values. Uh, small businesses obviously lose in this equation because uh, they assume a larger share of the tax burden as the residential rate continues to go down. And the state budget uh, loses uh, under this scenario, our current scenario, because uh, as, as Gallagher forces the residential rate down and it erodes uh, local tax bases, uh, local school districts are challenged to fund K through 12. And the state has a, an obligation to step in and backfill those school districts. So the state has assumed a larger and larger share of the uh, K through 12 funding partnership over time. And that has uh, resulted in less money available to the state to pay for other things like transportation and uh, higher ed. Uh, conversely, if we, if we pursue a strategy where we have local voters raise local mill levies just enough to offset Gallagher's reduction of the residential rate, well, the winner in that scenario is local public service providers because we're stabilizing the revenue stream uh, for local services. Uh, and the state budget benefits because to the extent we can stabilize revenue for local services, we stop the required backfill of the state for K through 12. Uh, the loser in that equation is small businesses because every time we vote to raise the mill levy, that's a real tax increase for, for small businesses. So not only do they have a larger share based on a higher rate, but now they have a higher tax uh, burden on top of that. Uh, and rural communities suffer disproportionately in this example because they have a smaller commercial tax base uh, that they are uh, that they can spread uh, that increased mill levy burden across. So, in conclusion, the Gallagher Amendment will continue to erode the residential tax rate over time and the corresponding residential tax base that funds local services uh, as long as residential values continue to outpace the growth of non-residential values in Colorado. 
and rural communities will continue to suffer a disproportionate adverse impact as, as it erodes their, their uh, tax base to fund local services. And any efforts by any taxing jurisdiction to raise local mill levies just enough to mitigate the uh, Gallagher's reduction of the residential rate will continue that shift in the tax burden from homeowners to businesses. Uh, and because Gallagher is embedded into our state constitution, uh, voters adopted it in 1982, if, if Coloradans want anything different, um, it's up to them to, to do it because the legislature cannot amend the constitution, only the people can. Which brings me full circle to where we started. Uh, Building Better Colorado hosted a statewide conversation on this topic uh, last year in 37 communities. We engaged about 1800 civic leaders. We talked about gallagher Tabor Amendment 23. And as concerns the Gallagher Amendment, we looked at five different potential policy options, beginning with the option of doing nothing. Uh, and uh, as you can see on this chart on the left there, the, the idea of doing nothing was not uh, popular at all. Uh, over 90% of people thought we need to do something different. And the preferred consensus policy option that grew out of that statewide conversation was uh, to repeal the Gallagher Amendment. Over 72% of participants recommended that. And it was really a, a very strong bipartisan recommendation. 73% uh, of participating Democrats, 66% of Republicans, and 70% of unaffiliated voters. And as you know, uh, since then, uh, your legislature now has referred that idea to your ballot uh, this year uh, with similar bipartisan support. I believe uh, uh, about three quarters of the state legislature embraced that idea, which was very close to what we saw in our statewide uh, conversation last year. Uh, and so I apologize I might just in, um, if, if you have any conclu concluding remarks, but um, I did want to move us on so that we can stay on our schedule, if that's all right. <laughs> yes, I'll just I'll wrap this up, just explain what the, the proposed ballot measure will do, and then we're done. So the ballot measure will uh, repeal the Gallagher Amendment, that frozen 45-55 ratio in the Constitution. It will also repeal the 21% reference to the initial residential rate, which we started at in 1982. The combination of those two things will effectively freeze the residential rate at 7.15% forever, unless the voters change it, in the same way that all other uh, the rate for all other property has been frozen at 29%. And it will also rem remove from the Constitution all of those uh, assessment rates for all classes of property, which means uh, they will only be found in statute at that, power, at that point, which means that your legislature would again be empowered to potentially lower an assessment rate on any class of property, but they couldn't raise it because, again, Tabor requires a statewide vote. So um, Gallagher will not raise or lower the assessment rate on your house or on any class of property. All it will do is, is stop, repealing Gallagher will just stop the formulaic erosion of the residential assessment rate. So thank you very much, Caitlin. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and, and turn it back to you. Well, thank you so very much. And um, I think we'll probably forego questions and move on to Chris, but I did wanna uh, raise one comment that I see in the chat box from Dan Metzger um, noting, and, and I think this is correct, but you can confirm that um, while you use the term houses when referring to residential um, for our, our industry, um, we also wanna note that multifamily and apartments are also considered residential. Yes. Uh, so for purposes of gallery, or, so there's a little bit of a balance on the burden of the 29% on commercial, but the uh, benefit, if you will, to the lower tax rate for some of those multifamily projects. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you again, Reeves. And uh, I will go ahead and, and turn this over and introduce Chris Brown. Um, so Chris is the Director of Policy and Research with the Common Sense Institute. Since joining CSI in the fall of 2017, Chris has led the research effort on a range of policy issues um, facing Colorado. Those include modeling the economic impacts of Proposition 112, which relates to oil and gas setbacks, Senate Bill 200 regarding para reform, and then also trying to answer the question, what if Colorado schools were number one? Uh, thank you, Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Fantastic, thank you. Um, let me move to the next, uh, next slide here. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction and uh, wanna just you know, further introduce CSI for those of you not familiar. We are a uh, non-partisan, non-advocacy, free enterprise think tank uh, based here in Colorado that studies, you know, our mission is to study, analyze, and uh, communicate ultimately the findings of our research to inform Coloradans on, you know, pressing issues that uh, they're facing. And lo and behold, this ballot happens to be one of the, you know, uh, more consequential areas that voters uh, actually have a direct say in. So very excited to be a part of this. And um, I will leave a link at the end of this to where our ballot guide is, which includes uh, resources for all of our uh, research papers, where you can dig a little bit more into 
but I just want to touch on the, the high level um, uh, findings for three key issues. Next slide. First is uh, Proposition 116 related to a reduction in across the board state income tax, uh, uh, state income tax reduction across the board. Um, voter approval, Proposition 117 related to voter approval for certain new enterprise fees and Proposition 118 related to establishing a paid family medical leave insurance program. We also included uh, some work on Amendment B, again, including that ballot guide that echoes a lot of Reeves findings, um, but uh, we won't touch on that today. Next slide. So Proposition 116 asks somewhat of a the more straightforward question I think you'll find on, on the ballot this year that asks whether or not we should reduce the state income tax, the current flat income tax from 4.63% to uh, 4 6 excuse me, 4.55%. So that is a 0.08% uh, reduction. For context, for those of, of you uh, doing crunching the numbers here, uh, it, it amounts to about an $8 savings, uh, $8 tax savings for every $10,000 in taxable income, whether you're an individual or uh, a corporation. The total estimated reduction in income tax revenue is in the ballpark of about $160 million in the full, first full year of implementation, uh, amounting to about a reduction of 1.7% of the projected uh, total income tax collections. It represents about 1% to 1.2% of total state revenue collections. Next slide. Uh, the question that we asked, uh, which we often ask in our, our work, are what are the economic impacts? And in order to determine the economic impacts, we often run these sorts of questions through a, a simulation model that we, uh, that we operate, the REMI model. And we develop two scenarios based upon really the uncertainty of how the state would, would respond to a reduction in, in revenue. Next slide. And so if we, again, we can look at the individual impacts, but if we look on the, the aggregate, you know, statewide macroeconomic impacts, really depending upon how the state responds, whether or not they cut employees directly, or you cut uh, state spending on equipment and purchases, capital investments, um, we would see a net, a net change in employment on the order of about 300 jobs lost, primarily in the public sector, to uh, a net increase in about 1,500 jobs, again, driven by the boost in private sector savings, um, and would increase statewide GDP on net between a loss of about $800,000 to a, a boost of about 400 million. Now, for context, again, state GDP is currently just under about $400 billion. So this is, uh, again, you know, less than 1% um, boost in GDP against current projections. Next slide. Um, I go to the next slide. We can skip this one. Uh, so moving to Proposition 117, this asks whether or not voters want approval of uh, a, a approval of future uh, increases or establishing new state enterprises. So if a new uh, proposal to create a new fee-based enterprise would raise, is projected to raise fees by over $100 million in the first five years of the program, then it would trigger a vote of the people in the same way that um, uh, voters have approval over tax increases. And there is a legal distinction and a, and a somewhat of a distinction between fees and taxes that I don't, I won't get into all of that right at the moment, but uh, understand that, um, uh, at the moment, there is there is this distinction, and, and uh, what we'll, what we want to detail is exactly how the fee based revenue has grown relative to tax based revenue. So next slide. So since the establishment of Tabor, uh, we've seen as a share of total revenue, uh, fee based revenue grow at a much much faster rate 
than, uh, than total tax revenue. So for every dollar growth in tax revenue, we've seen fee-based revenue grow by over $4. Next slide. <clears throat> you can see here uh, a, sl a, sl a slice of what those fee-based enterprises are um, and what they looked like in 1994, what they looked like in 2006, and then again, what they looked like in uh, fiscal year 2018 and how much revenue was associated with each. Up top, as uh, you may be looking at, is uh, higher, uh, higher education related enterprise. So that includes tuition and fees charged to students, which uh, pre previously were funded through, largely through the general fund and fee-based revenue was subject to TABOR uh, until about uh, mid 2000s. And that has since been exempted from the TABOR limits. And as a result has grown outside the TABOR cap, um, but it represents the largest portion of, of fee-based revenue. Next slide. Um, one, one more slide here. Just to make sure we get to the Prop 118. So while fees are not income taxes, are not taxes, there is a distinction. Uh, if we were to raise, if instead of paying for various services and expenditures through the general fund, through an increase in income tax, uh, as opposed to raising fees, we can see that in 2001, the state income tax would have had to increase from the current rate of 4.63% to just under 6%. Uh, however, in, fast forward to 2018, the current state income tax would have to increase to 7.4% uh, um, to cover uh, non-higher education related fees or uh, over 14.5% if it were to in fact cover uh, higher education related fees and, and tuition. So again, just another metric to sort of understand the relative uh, impact of this revenue uh, being generated again outside of taxes and how much taxes would have to increase in order to cover uh, the growth in fees as a result. So if there's any questions, I, I guess I may be able to parse out uh, where to go from here, but let's move on to Proposition 118. Okay, this is a question uh, whether or not to establish a, a statewide paid family and medical leave insurance program. Uh, I think it's important to understand that this program would cover, is proposed to cover both family related leave, that's caregiver leave, that's bonding leave with a newborn, as well as uh, covers, would cover uh, uh, personal medical leave. So that's leave that's typically covered under temporary disability, short-term temporary disability related coverage. Next slide. What we did is developed a, a model, a simulation model of the program to be able to quantify and estimate the actual costs uh, as the program is funded by a payroll tax, a payroll premium. Now this would establish uh, an enterprise. So this somewhat relates to Proposition 117 we just, we just talked about as this would establish a new state enterprise that would um, be funded through a new fee charged to all uh, employee wages that would be shared, <coughs> excuse me, that would be shared 50% by the employer and 50% by the employee. Those that take leave would have their wages replaced at a progressive rate, which uh, is up to 90% wage replacement for those in the lower income scale. It would allow for 12 to 16 weeks of leave. Uh, and again, it, it provides a combination of paid family and short-term disability. Next slide. Um, I touched on the idea that uh, this premium would start at 0.9% of wages for the, per for the first two years of the program and would be, would be paid for 50% by employees, 50% by employers. The, the, you know, the law does uh, stipulate that employers can pass along 50% of their share of the cost uh, in the form of reduced wages for their employees. 
Um, and small businesses with fewer than nine employees, nine or fewer employees, uh, those employers would not have to pay the employer share of the premium. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> so I think the most important thing to understand as we model the cost and think about the cost is that if we look at the red line in this particular chart, the benefits, particularly this wage replacement rate as it compares to other established programs is much higher than other states. And the important thing to realize is that like insurance, like any insurance program, if the, the cost of the premium is dictated by the use of the program, <coughs> excuse me. And what we've tried to estimate is given the higher level of benefits, to what degree would we expect to see higher utilization and potentially higher costs? Next slide. So we ran three scenarios that looked at different ranges of utilization and then put a, an estimate and modeled out where we think that premium would have to be in order to fund the level of benefits. So our low scenario has a premium down on the lower left side of 0.7%. Our middle scenario, which um, <coughs> I'll get into in a little bit, has a premium of 1.12% in the long run, and the high scenario would be over 1.7%. Um, I think, uh, and we base these estimates and utilization based upon reports that were provided to the 2019 Family Leave Task Force coming from a third party actuary and uh, University of Denver economists. Next slide, please. And I guess one thing I should note on that slide that I, I forgot was, the program includes a premium cap of 1.2%. So in the statute, it would say the premium cannot go above 1.2% uh, of wages. And if, if the costs or the benefits were to rise to a point where the premium would need to go above that, then uh, within statute, it could the, the administrator could not raise the premium any higher. It would face solvency questions and would likely have to be go back to the legislature to either reduce benefits or allow for that cap to expand. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you can see here, we've worked out what that cost and premium would be for an individual. At $50,000, uh, our low scenario, uh, it would be a premium of about $178 a year. Our mid scenario would be about a $280 premium annually. And then our high scenario would be about $425. Now this is just for the employee. Next slide. Um, due to some of the mechanics of how the premium would have to adjust over the first couple of years, um, by 2025, the employer share of the premium relative to a 2019 corporate income tax collections of just 700 million, the total tax increase for employers would represent about a $1.3 billion increase or roughly 200% increase in corporate income taxes. Again, to give you a sense of the scale of this program. Next slide. Let's, um, let's move, to, let's keep going to the next slide so we can, um, if there are questions, I'd be able to happy to get to them. I guess one point that I'd like to dive in a little bit is the importance of understanding the impacts across different types of businesses. And the fact that this is a one size fits all and, and a main question on what the economic impacts are would ultimately hinge on whether or not companies not only have to pay the direct cost of the premium, but also have to replace workers. They also have higher wage employees where they would actually need to replace a higher level of those uh, employees' wages that take leave. And so we've modeled out a couple different scenarios for say a restaurant versus a professional service or a biotech research company. And the impact on firm margins is, is very different, uh, undoubtedly. And so this one size fits all has very different impacts across businesses, um, which is a big reason why paid leave is offered or is not offered at various degrees currently in the market um, because of the realities of each, each individual firm. Next slide. 
Okay, so where I'd like to leave it on 118 is ultimately the program has a higher level of benefits compared to other programs uh, across the state, across the other states that include uh, some state level paid leave uh, benefit programs. Um, there is a premium cap, which ultimately threatens the solvency of the program if the benefits rise above where that cap is. And in our scenarios, somewhere between the middle and high scenario, which we think is, a, is where the likely outcome would, would fall. Um, the program faces solvency and there's no mechanism in the statute to, re to ever reduce benefits. Um, and so while insolvency is less of a risk because of we think legislature may go back and just have the ability to increase that cap and raise the premium, um, the higher cost is ultimately the, the risk both for individuals and for employers. Um, so uh, if there are questions, I'd be happy to take those now or we can take them after. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate those overviews. I think we're going to hold off on questions with you because Senator Gardner has joined us and then we'll circle up and, and kind of close out with a handful of questions for the whole panel. Um, so good morning, Senator Gardner. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll give you a quick introduction and then turn the microphone over to you. Um, so Senator Gardner is well known to many of you on this webinar, but some things you may not know are that he's a fifth generation Coloradan from Yuma. He showed his ability to work across the aisle early in life. I learned this, uh, preparing this, uh, raised as a Democrat and becoming a Republican in college. Uh, he received his undergrad degree from CSU and his law degree from CU and has been named the third most bipartisan member of the US Senate. So again, thank you for joining us, especially in light of the fact that you had your debate last night. So <laughs> greatly appreciate you taking the time this morning. Um, our attendees are generally made up of members of the Colorado commercial real estate industry. And so we're certainly anxious to hear your thoughts on this election. Um, thanks so much for joining us and I'll turn it over to you and we can conclude with a few questions if that's all right with you. Well, Caitlin, thank you very much for the chance to be with you today and to Nayop, thank you very much for your continued support and thank you very much for uh, the, the work that we've been able to do together over the last six years and uh, uh, hope to earn your support for the next six years as well. Uh, if you look at the work that we have uh, done for this economy in Colorado and across this country with the 2017 tax cuts and the opportunities that we were able to uh, to put into place for the people of this country, we had record low unemployment growth uh, rates. Excuse me, we had record low unemployment rates, uh, record high employment growth. Uh, and those are things that we've talked about over the years is the challenges of finding employees. We had a household income growth in Colorado, a nearly $2,000 increase in household income. Uh, the Western United States, so we saw the Western region see nearly 7% increase in household, uh, household income as a result of our economic policies that we have pushed and, and put into place. Regulatory reforms that have made a difference in allowing trillions of dollars, uh, over a trillion dollars to come back into the United States from overseas to invest right here in the United States. Uh, in Colorado alone, if you look at opportunity zones across the state of Colorado, we've seen real estate investments, uh, uh, affordable housing projects. If you work, if you're a wage earner in an opportunity zone, you're earning wages at a, a rate that's 8% higher than somebody who's not in an opportunity zone. And those are all things, of course, that happened prior to the pandemic. With the pandemic, nobody has, there are very few uh, that have been affected like commercial real estate has been. And what that will do, not just at the present time, but how long term effects uh, uh, impact and change the face of commercial real estate, what it looks like uh, and what it will look like. Uh, we need to make sure that we address three things as a result of this pandemic. Number one, we need to make sure that we continue to address the health emergency. Number two, make sure that we continue to help people, individuals get through this together. Uh, making sure that people have uh, uh, unemployment help, making sure they're able to put food on the table. And three, making sure that we get businesses back open, back on their feet and able to spring back into its full force once uh, we get this pandemic behind us and our economy fully moving again, which we have to do. But we need to make sure that we get it to those numbers that I was telling you about prior to the pandemic. And then we need to even go further beyond that. Uh, so I, I've worked hard over the last six years to become the third most bipartisan member of the United States Senate. Uh, I've passed more legislation into effect than the entire Colorado congressional delegation combined. Uh, and that's everything from the most recent legislation that I passed uh, uh, the nine, to create a 988 National Suicide Prevention Hotline uh, to the Great American Outdoors Act that uh, is the most significant conservation victory this country has seen in over 50 years and will put the biggest investment of dollars into our public lands uh, in the history of our country. But, uh, and that, that job will, will help our economy. That, that bill will, will create jobs that will help our economy as well. 
In fact, it's estimated that the Great American Outdoors Act will create over 100,000 jobs across our country, and it will create uh, uh, thousands of jobs in Colorado as we work to improve our national parks and maintain our forests, uh, rebuilding roads uh, throughout our national wildlife refuges and beyond. Uh, it really is going to help investment and create that infrastructure that we need. So a couple things that we need to do going forward. Number one, I was uh, obviously very supportive of the many multiple packages of COVID relief that we have passed and put into law, including provisions that put over $10.4 billion back into Colorado businesses through the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, we need another round of relief for the American people. We need another round of Paycheck Protection Program dollars, uh, allowing a second draw on loans. We need additional support for people who are struggling right now. We need to help make sure that small businesses are back on their feet and running. We need to help education. We need to help uh, make sure that we help families with child care needs. We need liability protections. Uh, to make sure that we have that certainty. Without certainty in an economy, without confidence in the economy, you cannot have a thriving, strong economy. We need to get back uh, onto our feet with that. And so a couple weeks ago, I supported a measure to address all of those things. Unfortunately, uh, we had more than a majority of support. We had 52 votes for it, more than uh, a majority. Unfortunately, uh, there was a filibuster and we didn't uh, get to the 60 votes that, that was needed in order to pass it, but we simply have to because the American ex the people are expecting and demanding of us. Uh, I'm excited about the work that we've done uh, to benefit all four corners of our state. Uh, it was mentioned in the introduction of where I'm from, out here on the Eastern Plains, right above me, I think in the Northeastern corner. Uh, my family immigrated there, gosh, a uh, uh, hundred some years ago. Uh, and uh, both sides of my family have been in that area. If they just stayed in the covered wagon for maybe 10 or 20 days more, they could have been in Aspen or Vail, but they stopped in Yuma and I'm very grateful that they did. Uh, but we have a, 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 a small family business there a uh, business that has been in the family for over a hundred years. We sell farm equipment. Uh, and uh, I've told some of you this story before. There's a little chunk of concrete on Second Avenue and Main Street that has the initials of my great, great grandfather uh, imprinted uh, onto that chunk of concrete. Uh, and when we go for a walk with our family and our kids, our three kids that uh, we all still live in Yuma, and we walk by that little piece of concrete, we wonder, will our kids have the same chance, the same opportunities, the same, uh, the, the, the same kind of hope uh, to live their dreams, to start their businesses, to take their families where their successes will be built. Uh, if we continue down the road of higher taxes, more regulations, uh, a majority that wants to eliminate oil and gas, uh, that wants to eliminate the filibuster, to pack the courts, to reverse the 2017 tax cuts, the answer is no, they won't have that opportunity. But I believe in Colorado. I believe in the opportunities of this state. And that's why I know uh, we will prevail in November and we will together continue uh, to reach that highest peak that is in Colorado and further beyond. So thank you very much for the chance to be with you today. Uh, Caitlin and Kathy, thanks to all of you. And now I'll just turn it over to you and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Sure, and um, anyone out in the audience, feel free to answer questions. And I know we have a few that were kind of pre-submitted as well. So maybe I will start there. Um, so I know you just mentioned when you were uh, speaking that we need another round of a coronavirus uh, stimulus package. What do you think the chance is that that will get taken up before the end of this year? Well, it needs to be done now. It needs to be done now. Unfortunately, uh, you saw with the bill uh, a couple of weeks ago that included uh, uh, billions of dollars for Paycheck Protection Program money and a second draw for businesses. Uh, you saw it had $105 billion for education. That's more money than the House of Representatives had in their legislation. Uh, it had dollars for child care uh, support. It had $10 billion for the post office. It had money for vaccines. It had money for personal protective equipment. It had money, it had language in there dealing with liability protection, all things that uh, everybody supports. Uh, even my opponent talks about the support for the small businesses and the Paycheck Protection Program loans and money for schools and money for research and money for, uh, but yet they oppose that bill. And there's one simple reason they oppose that bill. They opposed it because they believe by depriving the American people and economy of the help that they need today, they will get the political outcome that they hope for on November 3rd. And it's sick. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen Nancy Pelosi's interview last night with Wolf Blitzer on CNN, uh, I would hope that you would watch it uh, because it clearly shows where Wolf Blitzer says, shouldn't we pass relief now? Uh, and Nancy Pelosi says, no, we shouldn't uh, because uh, she does not want to negotiate. And uh, again, uh, I, let's vote for relief to the American people. Uh, there is no such thing as an alpha and omega bill that's going to solve every period and comma of need in this country. Uh, we have passed multiple pieces of legislation. There will be multiple more coming, 
but why deprive the American people of the help they need now? It's all about politics and it's shameful. Thank you. Um, so assuming I'm going to switch topics on you, but assuming you're reelected, one of the um, high priorities for NAOP at, a, at, a, at the corporate and federal level is around transportation infrastructure. So uh, you touched on this, but wondering if you could delve a little deeper on how you'd like to see that move forward in the coming year or two. I know it's a priority for our members. Yeah, absolutely. Look, infrastructure is so critically important, uh, highways, roads, bridges, but also infrastructure beyond that, like uh, waterways, drinking water systems, uh, internet uh, uh, availability across the, the state. So uh, over the last several years, I've brought over $300 million back to Colorado to expand I-25 North. I learned that there are two I-25 Norths in Colorado. Uh, I-25 North from Colorado Springs to Denver, I-25 North from Brighton to Fort Collins. We've been able to put money into both I-25 North's uh, projects uh, to make sure that they're expanding lanes and, and solving uh, congestion. Uh, we put uh, over $60 million uh, that we were able to secure for it, for I-70 through the mountains uh, and expansion lanes and management of, uh, of traffic through there. Uh, and uh, we just uh, introduced a bill to create and designate the Ports to Plains Highway as an interstate on the Eastern Plains of Colorado. Uh, infrastructure does a couple of things. Number one, uh, we need it for a growing state. Uh, obviously, uh, a, a huge chunk of our roadways uh, are failing right now. Uh, and uh, when an inter interstate system looks a lot like it does and it did in the 1960s, uh, and yet the state has more than doubled in size and is on that trajectory again, it shouldn't look like it did 60 years ago. Uh, it needs to look like a modern day interstate system. And that's why, excuse me, I've worked hard to make sure that we have a modern day interstate system uh, to, to be funded uh, to, to meet the needs of growth, traffic, and freight that we have. I've been able to pass a few pieces of legislation uh, recently that would give Colorado a leg up when it comes to securing more funding, including legislation that would give priority dollars, priority grant dollars uh, to states that have seen a high population growth, that's Colorado, of course, and to see a state that has a tremendous amount of freight traffic, and that's also Colorado. So that has helped to benefit the state when it comes to it. We have an EP, we have a highway reauthorization bill that passed unanimously out of committee. Uh, it needs to pass now so that we can get that done. Uh, and I'd like to see a bigger, more robust package of infrastructure funding uh, that could be that light at the end of the tunnel uh, for construction and infrastructure and an infusion of jobs in our state right now and our country uh, for stimulus for uh, our economy that's much needed. Thank you. Yeah, I think we certainly see that as something that a, a bipartisan effort could support and, and move along. So appreciate that. Uh, here at a local level, kind of across Colorado, and it's something that NAOP and, and Kathy, bless her heart, has worked very closely on our executive director. But we're seeing a number of Colorado municipalities adopt different version, versions of building code efficiency goals, right? So Maybe it's a new building code, maybe it's a green building code, net zero building plans, but different municipalities are taking these up in different ways. Um, NAOP has really worked to be at the table and be part of that conversation and provide our expertise along the way to just kind of show how a particular code will impact and, and, and kind of work to, to navigate that with the, um, the cities and counties. We are, however, seeing a bit of a patchwork quilt now of different rules and regulations, depending where you are. I know it's something that's been talked about at a federal level. Um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on federal legislation around advancing building code efficiencies. Well, yeah, so, so a couple things on uh, the national uh, plan. I really don't want to see a national uh, building code take place. I don't think that the federal government Congress is the right place to make uh, decisions for local communities, whether that local community is Lamar, Colorado or Fort Collins, Colorado. I just don't think Washington DC should be driving that. So, uh, you know, I, I want local control to remain local control. I know that can be frustrating, but I also want the state to be able to determine how that looks, uh, but not, not decide that Washington knows how to design Aspen uh, that Washington knows what to do for Grand Junction, uh, but let's make sure that Coloradans drive Colorado solutions. Uh, that's where I, where I believe uh, sort of planning, building codes, those kind of things should uh, should should direct themselves. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll open it up to our, our group or the panel if there's any other questions. But if not, I know you have a busy morning, and we can certainly let you go as well. <laughs> well, yeah, no, happy to take any questions. Now, these conferences, is this a full-day conference for NAOP, or is it a multi-day conference? 
This morning we're just doing a panel, so we've. Uh, yeah. But before you joined, we had a great discussion and presentation about the amendment, uh, Amendment B, repeal of Gallagher, and then uh, just we're talking about a variety of other statewide initiatives. And so NAOP yeah. did take a position to support repeal of Gallagher. Um, and then following you, we're going to be hearing from Councilman uh, Jolyn Clark from the Denver City Council talking about um, a couple of Denver initiatives, particularly the climate sales tax. Got it. Well, you, you, nobody can complain about bathroom breaks or snacks and the food during a Zoom conference call. So <laughs> just <Yeah>. morning coffee. <laughs> morning coffee, right. Yeah. Any Good questions? Morning. Happy to take. Good morning, Senator. Kathy Barsner here. Hey, happy Kathy. to see you. Um, I, I just thought it'd be interesting to get your input. Um, I know this isn't a federal issue, this is a state issue, but you represent the entire state and you were a, a state legislator here and you come from a rural area. What's your thought on the repeal of the Gallagher Amendment? Yeah, look, I, I'm afraid that if you give the state legislature the power to tax, it's going to more than they can right now uh, to mess around with it. They're going to mess around with it and they're going to create a lot of problems for both commercial and residence property owners. Then it's going to end up in a situation where everybody's paying a lot uh, more to the state than they otherwise would. So uh, I am concerned about it because I do think that that um, if the state legislature, as it's currently composed uh, in this state environment right now, uh, gets its hands on uh, the ability to do things, they will do it and the result will hurt our economy. Okay. Um, I, and while we're waiting for other people, I, again, I would encourage you to put questions in uh, the question and answer feature um, because this is a unique opportunity to um, get to bend the ear of our junior senator for um, this period of time. And we don't wanna waste a minute of it. Um, so let's assume um, you get reelected, uh, but the Senate switches to Democrat and uh, the vice president wins the presidency. Um, we've been hearing that um, tax reform uh, and repealing the uh, Trump tax plan would be on their radar. And there were a number of protections in that tax plan for commercial real estate, for instance, ensuring that the um, tenant improvements were set at 15 instead of at 39 and a half once we fixed the, um, the right. typographical error. Um, but, um, you know, we wouldn't want to have to go back to, to doing those in year in tax extenders, making sure carried interest um, for commercial real estate is protected. How would you go about protecting those things um, in a very different Washington? Yeah, well, to be clear, uh, they are, if, if they do get the majority in the Senate and they do take the White House, their number one goal will be to repeal the 2017 tax cuts. Uh, so we will see the, ma the, the, the most historic tax increase uh, uh, in modern time uh, when they do that. Uh, and uh, that will eliminate opportunity zones, uh, that will get rid of those because that was a part of the 2017 tax cuts that will eliminate the tax cuts uh, prematurely for small businesses that I believe should be made permanent going forward uh, on the pass-through side. Uh, the carried interest that you're talking about, that will be gone. Those protections will all be gone. How, you know, that's what in, under their plan if they were to succeed. Uh, obviously, uh, we don't support repealing the tax cuts. They would need 60 votes to repeal the tax cuts. Uh, and so if the majority flips and they have 51, 52, 53, 54 seats up to, 50, up to 60, they couldn't repeal it. But the other thing they've been saying that they will do is to eliminate the filibuster. Uh, and so if they eliminate the filibuster, they could do it simply by taking the majority. Uh, and uh, that, that is the alarming feature of what you've just said, because if they eliminate the filibuster, um, it will be more than just the tax cuts. Uh, they will move toward the government run health care. Uh, they will move toward the, the a Green New Deal like uh, environmental provisions. They will move to eliminate oil and gas. Remember, they're all running right now on eliminating oil and gas. And the numbers I had from NIOP uh, several years ago was a 30 some percent of downtown Denver was owned or occupied by an energy company. I'm sure that number has changed uh, in uh, over the last uh, several years, but it's still a huge part of our economy, a $31 billion part of our economy. And so I am concerned that uh, those are a few things that they would take on the chopping block if they get the majority, eliminate the filibuster. So could we have just a short civics lesson here? I get a number of questions all the time about people talk about this filibuster. What exactly is the filibuster and, and what does that mean? Yeah, so the this United States Senate operates uh, on unanimous consent, meaning in order to do anything, 
uh, all 100 senators have to agree. It requires bipartisanship. So unanimous consent means that, that everybody has to agree. Uh, and, and most things are done by unanimous consent in the United States Senate. You know, unanimous consent to, to adjourn, unanimous consent to recess, unanimous consent to turn to morning business, unanimous consent to bring up a bill, a nomination. Everything requires that. Most things are agreed to. Uh, in order to cut off debate, if you can't get unanimous consent, then you can cut off debate. Uh, if, if you don't get unanimous consent, it's called a filibuster, right? Somebody's objecting. Uh, you know, it's the Mr. Smith goes to Washington, going onto the Senate floor and filibustering. That's one version of it. Or it's just somebody denying, uh, you know, unanimous consent. And that's still both of them are a filibuster. The way that you cut off the filibuster, the way that you cut off debate is to uh, invoke something called cloture. To invoke cloture, it takes 60 votes to do that. So to end debate, let's say that, well, let's use the tax cuts as an example. You had, you know, Senate Bill 1 uh, to cut taxes. Uh, somebody objected to that going to the floor. Uh, so they, we had to have a motion to proceed to it. They filibustered that. We had to get 60 votes to move to the bill. If you have 60 votes, then you cut off debate. You end the filibuster. You move on to it. Now, maybe you have to do it for a couple of other procedures, but that's it. So uh, if you eliminate the filibuster, then you no longer have uh, to reach unanimous consent uh, you basically can move by a simple majority, 51, every time to cut off that debate, 51. So whoever's in the majority at that time will most likely stay in a perpetual majority, especially if they add Washington, D.C. as a state and Puerto Rico as a state, which they have already tried to do, adding uh, four more senators to their majority. Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, questions that were raised in our, our chat bar, so I'll read these out for you. Um, so Senator Gardner, as you know, change happens slowly. This year, stimulus is understandable, but how do we as a society pull back on the precedent of injecting more and more dollars into the economy, reducing personal responsibility and more reliance on the state pushing us towards a more socialist economy? Yeah, you know, if you look at what happened, I mean, obviously this isn't a situation where um, you know, a restaurant closed or you know, suffered because it had bad food or a hotel closed because it had dirty rooms. Uh, or a commercial office space saw its tenants leave because it was poorly managed. I mean, this was a situation where um, you had governments from mayors on up to the president say, socially distance, uh, masks, you're gonna, you know, you can't have food in service uh, in the room or in the building, you gotta send people home because you're limited in capacity. You can have curbside pickup, that's it. So it was a government driven shutdown. And so the government has a responsibility to get our country moving again. But you're right to be concerned about how that treasury can continue uh, to be served out and paid out. Uh, this is a heavy bill that will be paid for generations of Americans to come. We had to do it to get through it, but it has to stop and we got to get our economy open again. We got to get our economy moving again. You know, um, my, my opponent in this election said that he would shut down the economy uh, if uh, our test went above 5% again. Well, yesterday they did that. Uh, so he would once again have another shutdown of our economy. We can't we can't do that. We can't have another shutdown. The, the, the diseases of despair, poverty, health care will be far worse if we continue to destroy this economy. Uh, and so we've got to make sure that we get our economy open again. Um, so, uh, you know, I think those are all kind of things that, 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 we, that point to why we need to do more. But we got to have a balanced budget amendment going forward. I believe we got to have economic growth, record economic growth to pay for what we've done. We need to reduce spending where it makes sense. We're going to protect our, our Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security programs. You bet. But we need to make health care more, uh, more affordable, drive down costs, more transparency, those things. That has to be done to address the challenge. Because if you don't, you do have that socialism that doesn't just uh, uh, you know, linger or, 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 or for the time of the, the COVID-19. It's here to stay. And that's unacceptable. Thank you. So I'll, I'll conclude. This is actually a great question to conclude our time with you. Um, from the audience, you've been great at crossing the aisle to achieve results in this term. What would be your top couple goals in your next term? And then I know you you have a 1015. Well, thanks, Caitlin, for the question. Look, uh, yeah, I'm the third most bipartisan member of the United States Senate because I believe that if you if you start with something that's bipartisan, you end up with something that's bipartisan. Uh, I've passed more bills into law than the entire Colorado congressional delegation combined. Everything, like I said, from the 988 bill, the Great American Outdoors Act, to the American Innovation and Competitiveness Act, which focuses on research, science, development, uh, STEM programs for our kids, uh, and North Korean sanctions 
for their nuclear uh, weapons program. Uh, for the next six years, obviously, we have to focus on the two things that we continue to deal with today to get out of this pandemic and make sure that we have the vaccines distributed, developed, manufactured, and to get our economy moving again. Economy, 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 getting people back to work. The millions of people have lost work, getting businesses back on their feet. We have to do that. Uh, we we got to make sure that we get this uh, economic growth uh, that we saw prior to the pandemic. It needs to be amplified uh, to, to huge proportions after the pandemic, because that's how we get out. You can't tax our way out of the debt. You can't cut our way out of the debt. Economic growth is going to be key to getting out of that debt spiral. So we need to make sure that that economic growth is, is first and foremost uh, part of, uh, of any uh, new Congress uh, and any new term going forward. Well, thank you again for your time. Um, good luck in, in the coming weeks. And um, I hope you get maybe a nap or, or, or something in today after the debate, and then I'm sure a full morning. So thank you again. I'm sure there's not time for naps. But. No, okay. Thank you. Thank you for the chance to be with you, Kathy. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. And uh, uh, look, uh, honored to earn your support. Uh, we live in the best state and the greatest nation on earth. So thank you all. It's great to see you all. And I look forward to our continued work together. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. Um, so with that, I, I will go ahead and turn this um, over and introduce Councilman Dylan Clark. Thank you so much for making the time to be with us this morning. I know you also have a very busy schedule. Um, I know that the city is in the process of reviewing budget and other items. So uh, as a quick introduction, Councilman Clark was elected to Denver City Council in 2015, representing District 7. Uh, that's located in South Central Denver and includes neighborhoods such as Historic Baker, Platte Park, Ruby Hill, and Athmark Park. Um, Councilman Clark also uh, served as council president uh, for several years and just recently ended that tenure. Um, while on council, the councilman has championed policies that focus on mobility and the environment. So welcome councilman. Um, Thank you very much. And, and I think in particular, you have a great voice to speak about uh, ballot measure 2A and, and 2B as well. But um, there's a number of ma matters on the ballot, as you know, we have a pretty thick one in front of us. Uh, but your leadership on the climate sales tax and, and uh, measure 2A has been uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, with that, I'll turn, turn it over to you to, to touch on those and we can conclude with some questions. Great. Well, thank you, Caitlin. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. It is a big ballot. And um, there are, I think, 10 local initiatives. And I know that everybody is very excited about voting uh, at the top of the ticket, uh, the president and the Senate. But I hope that everyone will take the time to go all the way through because a lot of these Local initiatives are what really affect our city and our day-to-day -day life. So I know I only have um, uh, 10 or 15 minutes here to get through 10 initiatives. So I'm going to go through them pretty quick and then happy to answer any questions. So if we would just go to the next slide, please. So 2A um, that you just heard a little bit about is our, our climate funding measure. And this is, um, you know, this was a, a long process. And I will say that um, Naop and Kathy in particular's role in this um, cannot be overstated. Uh, I, was, I was working on legislation and racing towards a 2019 ballot initiative. And Kathy was, you know, one of the people who reached out to me and said, hey, um, you're going a little too fast. Can you slow down? Can we have a seat at the table? Can we talk this through? And that led to to uh, the city forming a task force uh, last November. That task force met almost every single week for seven months uh, before the pandemic and then as the pandemic hit and came up with an, a nearly 100 page document that is a blueprint for what Denver needs to do to combat climate change, um, to protect our citizens, to protect our way of life, to protect our economy and the tourism that we, we rely on. Um, and it's all in there as this, this is what we need to do now all the way through 2040 and, and even 2050. Uh, the, the first step in that, and, and this task force did include representative uh, you know, from the up and with Kathy, business community, all the way to the environmental community and everybody in between and came to unanimous consensus um, on this report and on um, this recommendation that city council referred to the voters, a measure to fund this work that would be a 0.25% increase in sales tax. So two and a half pennies on a $10 purchase, um, necessities uh, would be exempted from that. Uh, and it would create you know, a, a, a fund of about $40 million, although obviously uh, something like COVID has a, has a big impact on our sales tax. So 
possibly not that high in 2021, uh, to work on creating jobs in renewable and clean energy, making investments in solar and other renewable um, energy technology, um, providing transportation choices, helping people uh, move to a, a transportation system that's cleaner, uh, more access to public transportation, but also uh, access and incentives for how do people upgrade to uh, electrify their vehicles and electrify the systems in their home and in their buildings, the new ones that we're building and existing ones, and, and helping to provide incentives to, to fund that gap, um, and then helping uh, empower vulnerable communities to prepare, prepare for a changing uh, climate. Also a lot in there about uh, uh, upgrading and energy efficiency. We've had, you know, um, uh, Caitlin, I think was the one who asked the question earlier uh, of our Senator about building codes. And as our building code continues to get greener and greener with every update, um, there, there is, you know, a gap between some of the technologies where we want to be uh, to cut our emissions and wh where the market is. And so this would, this is really designed to be funding that goes back into the community that provides that gap incentive to help get people to net zero construction or upgrade their appliances and electrify their systems, um, install solar, those kinds of, uh, of programs um, to get right back in to the community, make those investments, make getting to those new requirements, whether they're coming from the citizens in the form of the uh, green roofs, which is now our green buildings initiative, um, or from building code updates. So this is a really excited, one, exciting one. And again, this process was made so much better by um, Nayop and, and uh, just another shout out to Kathy for her amazing leadership. So much better than where we were headed uh, to take that pause and tend to get this right. And, and I'm thrilled to have um, uh, Nayop support on this one. Uh, so if you, you go to the next slide. This is the other big ones. We have two really big ones and then a bunch of smaller ones on the ballot. This one is also a proposed um, sales tax increase. This is the same exact size as the climate sales tax. So another two and a half cents on that $10 purchase or a 0.25% increase. And these dollars create a, a, the same size fund, but would be um, allocated and reserved specifically for helping um, those most vulnerable in our community, those who are experiencing homelessness and really building pathways to housing, to services and upgrading our shelter systems. Uh, you know, prior to COVID when, when we could go and, and tour things and do things uh, differently than we are now, um, a group of city council members went and toured all of our current uh, homeless shelters. Well, not all of them, but almost all of the ones in the city. And it was really eye-opening um, and, and a good reminder for me that unlike paving streets and building rec centers and running libraries and, and, and providing, you know, police fire uh, services, uh, serving uh, and sheltering our homeless has not been treated as a core city service. Uh, it really is something that has grown up on the backs of uh, nonprofit institutions, um, faith institutions, who has led to this real patchwork of shelter. So we have everything on the spectrum from the Dolores Project, trauma-informed shelter, 24-hour access, places to store your belongings, on-site with uh, supportive housing, moving to permanent housing. It's that entire continuum. And they're getting amazing results for the folks who uh, come directly off of the street into there. A year later, the, the number of those people who are stabilized and housed is through the roof. On the opposite side of that, we have uh, places like the Crossroads Shelter that's run by the Salvation Army, where it is literally an old factory with no windows that houses between 500 and 1,000 men on any given night on mats this thick, six inches of part and 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 the rate of people going from that into housing uh, is not great and the rate of people choosing to sleep in a tent on the street over that option is what we are experiencing um, all of the time in our streets because it is it is not a good place to be it is it is not um, you know, it's, it's just not, we, we, we have to do better than that. Um, that, in fact, that shelter in particular, uh, the Salvation Army decided their core service was not serving single men, it was serving families. They were gonna walk away from that shelter, which would have eliminated about 50% of our beds on any given night, leading to even more uh, camping outside and possibly the courts overturning our, uh, our, our tenuous ability to enforce those laws. The city stepped in, was able to purchase that building and, and have the Salvation Army uh, continue to operate it for a few years. This money 
It's finally getting the city in to say, no, this is a core service the city has to take control of. We have to do it better. We have to do it right. We have to get people off of the streets, out of tents, into shelter and into housing. So it would allow us to do with Crossroads Shelter, uh, eight story zoning on a building that we now own to redo that shelter so that we have trauma-informed shelter instead of windowless uh, uh, former uh, factory uh, warehouse uh, shelter. Second floor, put all the services. So it's a 24 hour facility. People aren't kicked out at 6 a.m. And, and, and can't come back till eight. So they're off trying to um, figure out what to do all day. And then that gives us six floors left to do supportive housing, working into permanent housing and really uh, transformative projects to help us tackle um, this issue in our city. So that's what 2B would fund. We go to the next slide. And we go through these ones a little bit quicker. Uh, many of these are, are non-controversial. I will uh, flag a couple for you, um, just full disclosure that, that there is some level of opposition to. Uh, this 2C, um, currently, if the mayor puts something in front of city council, right? We want, we want a separation of, of powers so that there are real checks and balances um, and that the city council doesn't get too far off in one direction or the mayor without somebody being able to check them. Right now, if the mayor puts anything in front of city council for approval, any kind of contract, any kind of um, anything that we're voting on that the mayor puts in front of us, we're not allowed on city council to employ a professional. We have a very small budget. We have a very small, uh, you know, there are tens of thousands, 10,000 plus, maybe 15,000 employees on the mayor's side of the, uh, the ledger. And, and we have six employees who serve the city council so we don't always have an expert on hey we're talking about the airport or we're talking about you know sidewalks so and we can't employ a professional to look at what the mayor's put in front of us to add that expertise without the mayor signing that contract and so obviously uh, 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 it limits our ability to be a check and make sure hey we're not missing something in here if uh the person who's asking us to approve it also has control over whether we can employ an expert so all this does it does no increase in funding no increase in budget we would have to do it out of the current budget that we have but we could employ or hire a professional to take a look at things for us uh, without the mayor's approval of that hire you go to the next slide please 2D, we currently already have an advisory board of citizens who advises the head of our parks department, our transportation and infrastructure. DOTI is our Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, much bigger department and really one that um, our citizens uh, call in a whole lot more about than um, parks talking about, hey, I, this intersection by my house or near my business, it needs a four-way stop and it doesn't have one. We need a better crosswalk. These lights aren't timed right. Those kinds of transportation systems as we're, as we're talking about how do we move about our city and, and our transportation infrastructure, which is critical to every part of our daily life, doesn't have a board of citizens that, uh, um, that kind of uh, provides advice to that head. This mirrors our parks board, creates an advisory board for, for that position this board has no actual power to change those decisions. It's just a, a, another opportunity for citizen input and uh, kind of oversight of uh, that department. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, 2E, so this, this is one of the ones that um, has been kind of controversial. And um, I, I, I believe just yesterday, the Downtown Denver Partnership came out in opposition of this one. Uh, but this one would provide, again, as we're balancing the branches of government. Right now, the mayor gets to pick, has about 60 appointees. The mayor picks at the mayor's sole discretion. There is nobody else who gets to say, hey, maybe that person is not the right fit for that job. Um, this does not give city council approval authority of all 60 of those, only the the charter uh, departments, so the cabinet for the mayor, the head of parks, the head of public works, um, the head of the safety department, and then also the chief of police, sheriff, fire, um, city, uh, city attorney, um, uh, so kind of those top level cabinet level positions, which right now the mayor picks and puts in place, uh, they, he, the mayor would still get to pick that person, but would have to come and get it confirmed by the city council in a process that is similar to what we see at the state and the federal level that um, does not happen at the city level. This would allow city council to vote. It would still take a majority of city council members to vote that person down and force the mayor to pick someone new. Um, so this isn't any city council person gets to say, no, I don't like that. It would take a majority, but it, with the majority of council members in opposition, the mayor would be forced to pick a new person before appointing that position. Once they're appointed, city council still has no oversight over those. That person cannot remove that person is only upon uh, choosing of who that person is that city council would get one vote under 2E. Next slide, please. 
Two F, this one we came across in the middle of a pandemic when we were trying to keep people safe or adapting to Zoom meetings. Um, and there is a lot of outdated language that never contemplated this pandemic or the kind of technology that we have. Some of the language includes things that when city council is meeting, you have to literally open the door of the city council chambers. Well, we're not meeting in city council chambers right now. We're meeting virtually. We stopped to send a staff member into the city and county building to physically open that door so that we're not in violation of the city charter. Only people can change the charter um, are the citizens of Denver. So we have to put this to a vote so that we can clean up the language, make it relevant to today, today's technology, and the potential of not just a pandemic, but an emergency. If there was some sort of terrorist attack in downtown, we technically would be violating the charter if we don't send someone down to open that door in the city and county building. So that's what 2F does. Uh, 2G, this is the other one that, it, uh, that if there's any controversy that I've seen so far in any of them, um, this one is the, uh, the other one. And I believe also the Downtown Denver Partnership yesterday um, has taken a position to oppose this one. Um, this uh, right now, the, the mayor controls the budget process. Um, the mayor crafts the budget. We see the budget the same day that the members of the public uh, see the, the budget, has a lot of control over that. We have one part of the year, which we're in right now, where we go into budget hearings and we can make changes to that budget before it's adopted. Uh, we'll wrap that up here in, a, in about three weeks. Once that budget is adopted for 2021, then the only person who can initiate any kind of change to that budget, we get a new grant and money is coming in. We have to make changes to the budget because we have money we didn't anticipate, or there's a drop in revenue like we saw this year unexpectedly starting in March when um, COVID hit and, and the stay at home order came from the governor and, and, and the mayor and our, our budgets just tanked. The only person who can initiate any change to those budgets to address those things right now is the mayor. This would allow the city council to also initiate and respond to those kinds of situations with a mid-year uh, uh, budget change. Again, would require a majority of city council, um, but, but would allow city council to initiate that, which we can't right now. And then my last, I, uh, oh no, two more. Municipal broadband, uh, this, there's a state law that prohibits municipal governments from thinking about planning for spending money building out a municipal broadband network um, unless they first opt out of the state law. There is currently no plan for the city to build out a municipal broadband network, but many cities across the state are opting out of this so that should a time come when that does look like it's a good idea, uh, we would at least be able to have that conversation. And so this measure asks uh, Denver voters to opt us out so that down the road, if we want to have those conversations, we can. And next slide, please. This one, uh, the clerk currently has three appointed positions. It would like to move that to four and reshuffle how things are in the clerk's office with their appointees. Again, mayor, talk about 60 appointees, clerk and recorder has three and would like to adjust that uh, to four. And then the last one. Um, so we, uh, 2J is the uh, ban, uh, the repeal of the pit bull ban. So in Denver, um, in the late 70s, early 80s, there was a breed specific brand ban. You can't have a pit bull in the city and county of Denver. Um, since then, a lot of the science and thinking on this issue has evolved to say that it's not about specifically that breed. There are lots of nice dogs that have that breed in them. And there are a lot of mean dogs that have no pit bull in them. And you really should be focused on dangerous dogs and how to do them. So last year, we, we uh, adopted a, you know, a, um, a best uh, practices version of the uh, dangerous dog ordinance to protect citizens from all kinds of dogs, making this legislation arguably um, irrelevant now um, on pit bulls because we have our dangerous dog ordinance. City Council did, if you were like, hey, wait, I already heard about this. Didn't you guys already do this? We already voted to repeal this when we did our dangerous dog as part of the same thing. Uh, the mayor disagreed and vetoed it. And so now it is in front of voters to break the tie between city council saying we don't need this anymore and the, and the mayor feeling that we do. So this one is also uh, probably uh, one of the most contentious ones on there, at least from a city perspective. So uh, I think I went one minute over on my time. Sorry about that. But those were whew, all the Denver initiatives. That was impressive. <laughs> all the way down the it is a lot. Thank you so much. I may just have us run just a few minutes over. Um, would love to ask you just a couple of questions if that's all right. Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for your patience. Uh, I expect the ballot measures 2A and 2B um, are probably garnering most of the focus from our NAOP members. So, uh, and, and you described this really well, while NAOP opposed the original proposal from fall of 2019, 
um, which would have placed you know, really a, a substantial, if not the entire bur financial burden on the commercial real estate industry based on the work of the Climate Action Task Force and, and Kathy's involvement there. Um, we have taken a position of support at this time because we believe that the load is really being much more fairly shared across our community. Um, and, and that we all need to take that step forward for climate change. So one of the things that, that I often hear when I'm talking about this, this particular ballot measure is sort of a, a concern about the vagueness of the parameters or lack of understanding on, okay, this $40 million approximately is going to be generated. How do we know that it's going to be used in a way that in the right way and, and, and towards, the, towards the right goals? And, and I'll maybe just tag out a follow-up to that. You, you touched on this briefly, but particular to the commercial real estate industry, you know, what opportunities would you see being available um, that could be, you know, uh, an opportunity for, for those in, in our, our, our world to access some of those funds for, you know, building upgrades, efficiencies, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, we did a couple things to make sure that um, these dollars didn't just disappear into some sinkhole and 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 be spent on the wrong things. Uh, the the first and most important thing is we pulled the the staff, and there weren't many of them in the city who are doing climate work because the buildings people, the transportation people, the sustainability people were in different places. We pulled them out and created a new office um, led by an appointee of the mayor. So there's direct line of sight and and oversight there. Um, from our you know chief elected uh, official um, uh, to focus our efforts on hey what are we doing here on climate the other thing is we have this amazing roadmap that the task force put forward that says exactly what we need to do when we need to do it by uh, and and how we need to get there that that is that roadmap more uh, you know, more detailed probably than any other roadmap for funding uh, in the city that has outlaid, hey, this is what we need to do. And these are the exact goals that we need to meet. And here's how we need to focus on um, reducing carbon emissions. Now, obviously, as technology changes, and this is a long term um, issue, some of the, you know, okay, well, uh, transportation is now here versus buildings or building is, is now here may lead to, um, and the need for some flexibility in there to say, hey, we're going to need to adapt as technologies change, certain things become, uh, you know, reach parity at the market level so that we don't need incentives there. But this money is really designed, and, and to your, your um, the other part of your question, is really designed, like I said, to get back into people's hands. And so one of the things that, I, you know, I saw uh, working through the Green Roofs Initiative and, and uh, sitting on that task force also with Kathy and, and seeing um, you know, so many building owners saying, hey, look, we want to do the right thing, but like, you can't just keep piling these things on top of us that all cost more money, right? And some of those technologies are starting to come where it does make business sense. And, and if you look at it over the lifespan versus, but a lot of them are not there yet. And so really, um, I see this fund, a big part of what this fund does is oh, opens up the ability, the city has no ability to participate in that by helping and saying, hey, this new building code is coming. We now have this stretch green code. So now if you want to, if you want to do the green code voluntarily, we have incentive dollars to help you cover that gap. The difference between what it would cost you to build under the current code and this code, let's provide you with these incentives. What does it take to bring that into line so that you can do the things that we're hearing you want to do, but that there's that, that gap that makes it uh, really hard to do. Now we can assist um, uh, uh, business owners and building owners um, in doing those things with these funds. Did that? Did I get to the parts of your question there? Um, oh, sorry, there was on mute. Um, you did. So thank you so much. Um, so I think with that, just because we are hitting our time, and I and I don't see any um, new questions from the audience, I think we will go ahead and and conclude. Um, Kathy, I'll turn it back over to you and just thank you so much to our panelists and and those attending. And you know, as Kathy says. Uh, get a bottle of wine ready and, and make sure you get, as Councilman Clark said, to all the way to the bottom of the ballot because those local measures really do have um, often the greatest impact on our, on our work. Awesome. Thank you so much. I, I really want to thank our panel members um, and Caitlin for being such a great moderator. Um, I know we had a ton of information to try and share in a very, very short amount of time. Um, so to Reeves, Chris, Councilman Clark and, and uh, Senator Gardner, who had to move on to another uh, another event, I really want to just say thank you for for um, A, talking very, very fast in order to get as much in as you possibly could. Because um, I, and you must have been so terrific because 
and covered it all so well because we didn't end up with a lot of questions uh, in, in our question and answer feature. So um, thank you very much to you all. Again, a reminder, all of the participants were emailed our ballot primer this morning. Um, it has links to uh, all of these different measures. And uh, not only does it have the 11 statewide measures, it does include, Councilman Clark, the 11 Denver measures. So people can uh, can be ready for those to be able to get all the way through that. Um, and it also includes all of the Senate and House races um, in the state. So um, I want to especially thank our sponsors for today's program, DPC Development, Everwest Real Estate and United Properties. Um, you will be getting a uh, post event survey. And since this is our very first public policy series, we're looking at having another one um, in uh, November, December timeframe, which will recap the election and look forward to 2021 and what we see um, the impacts are of the, of the um election as well as looking forward to the 2021 legislative session. See, it's a good thing I wasn't the one doing all the fast talking because um, I would not have been able to do it. Um, again, encourage you to go to the NAP Colorado website for more details. Um, we will have a link to this webinar in case anyone had to leave early or you wanna share it with other people in your um, office. It'll be up on our NAP Colorado YouTube page and Jama did put a link to that in the chat features. So be sure and get that. And I would encourage you um, to go to that page and subscribe. Um, there, are thing, there are additional things you can use with your YouTube page once you get to hundred subscribers. So we're trying really hard to get to that hundred subscriber level. Um, and last but not least, if you have not already registered for the um, Oktoberfest celebration of the Rocky Mountain Real Estate Challenge that is coming up on Friday, um, and it will be at Exto Center. We're going to have a great program and opportunity to get together, and, and um, this will be sort of my first public ability to say I want to change our lexicon, our language. I want to stop social distancing. Don't panic, Councilman Clark. I want us to physically distance, but be socially present um, because we need that as, uh, as the social beings that we are. So um, we have an opportunity to get together physically distanced, but socially present, celebrate the uh, CU and CSU and the work, great work that they did um, for the Rocky Mountain Real Estate Challenge and to get a little teaser for next year's Real Estate Challenge. So with that, again, just thank you all for joining us. Thank you for sticking around. Um, I should have known we couldn't get through it in 90 minutes. Next time we might just add a, a couple extra, but thanks so much, everybody. Have a really great day. Stay strong, stay, stay, stay safe and stay well, and we'll see you soon.